Hello. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is David, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Meta. Today, I'll be talking to you about uh, adding zero copy to, um, to the Linux kernel using IOU ring as the user API. And this is, um, this is the work that I'm doing uh, in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Pavel, who's in the audience somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> Cool. So agenda for today, I'll first start off with the, uh, the kind of give some context to the problem, um, why, we, uh, why it's important, why we want to solve it. Um, and then I'll move on to um, a very quick overview of IOU ring for those of you who are not familiar with how it works. Then I'll talk about the kind of design and implementation for our proposal. We'll look at some early results that we've been getting. Um, and then we'll talk about the kind of current status of the project and what we want to do next. And then I'll leave a little bit of time at the end for um, a short Q&A. Cool. Okay, so why do we want to have zero copy in the Rx path? So the Linux kernel um, networking stack has adds a bunch of overheads to um, on the receive path. Um, in order to receive each packet, it has to make several paths through um, through both PCIe and also to, um, also to the system DRAM. So the packet first gets DMA'd into uh, kernel memory in the host. So that's one trip over PCIe and one trip over the uh, memory bandwidth. And then in, in order for the user to actually receive the, uh, the, the, the payload for the packet, there needs to be another copy into user space, which adds a, uh, another copy, uh, sorry, adds another trip over the uh, memory bandwidth as well. So this, um, in certain situations can fully saturate the memory bandwidth. And we kind of see that in, in production. And um, copying as well has a, uh, has a CPU overhead. And as the line rate increases, that overhead kind of add, adds more and more as well. So how do we solve the problem? But it's, this has been a problem for a long time and we, we, we've, we've known that in the community. Um, the kind of classic way of solving this is, well, let's just get the kernel out of the way. Let's bypass the kernel entirely. And there's a whole host of different technologies to, to do this. I've listed some of them in, in the slides here. We've got DPDK, we've got uh, PF ring, um, we have AFXDP sockets, and also we have uh, Rocky or RDMA as well. Uh, these definitely work. Um, they can give you high throughput, low latency, some mixture of both, um, but the, the kind of problem with these solutions is since you're bypassing the kernel, you, you, you need to handle the, uh, the kind of networking stack in user space, right? If something has to do the work, whether it's the kernel or, or, or user. And in addition to that, all of your libraries and services that kind of expect the presence of a uh, networking stack, they're not going to work anymore out of the box. So you kind of have to redesign and re-architect your entire system around these solutions. And that is very expensive in terms of how much work uh, needs to be done. And that might make sense for certain companies um, who, are, who kind of really need the performance, um, like finance companies doing high frequency trading kind of comes to mind. Um, but for other companies like us, that cost is too prohibitive. Um, so this is not, um, not going to work for, for, for us. So instead, our proposal is to um, kind of have like a hybrid solution where we kind of split the networking stack into two. We have a standard uh, control plane path in the kernel where the headers go through the networking stack in the kernel as usual, and they get processed. And then the, um, and then the data goes straight into its destination um, in, inside of the user space host memory. And we, we kind of do this by uh, two different parts. The first part is we set up the hardware such that um, we, we receive the packet payloads straight into its destination and such that, um, the, uh, such that SKBs end up in the sockets uh, as per normal. And then the second part is, you know, we're going to use IOU ring to, to read, the, uh, read the SKBs out of the socket and get the data into um, user space. Uh, in, in like a very efficient way. A quick primer over, um, also a quick primer about IOU ring. Uh, so IOU ring is a new way of doing asynchronous IO in the kernel. And it does this by adding two different uh, shared ring buffers between the kernel and the user. So there is a submission queue 
and a completion queue. So the way it works is rather than making a syscall for every like receive or send, um, you instead prepare your requests called uh, submission queue entries and you prepare them, you write them into this shared ring buffer, the submission queue, and then um, you kind of kick the work off by entering the kernel, entering IOU ring via uh, just one system call. Then the kernel does the work, services the requests as normal, and then for every request it's gonna once it's done, it's going to post a completion into the completion ring, and then um, it's going to return control back into the back into user space, and then the user space can then proceed to go through the completion ring and process um, all the completions. Yeah, so the, the first step is to prepare the requests. Um, I wrote some um, like code examples. So we, we first get the uh, submission queue entry. We then call, um, there's a bunch of different helper methods that kind of prepares the, the request. And here we're preparing a receive request. So the, the kind of arguments are very similar to like a standard receive syscall. Um, and then in doing so, we are already kind of uh, moving the, the, the tail pointer for the, uh, for the submission queue. Uh, then we kind of submit the work, we enter the kernel, this is a, this is a syscall. And um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. In, in, in this particular case, the user is saying, okay, enter the kernel, and then I wanna wait for a number of, like a fixed number of completions. And then when you reach that number, please wake me up again so I can um, process, the, uh, process the results. Yeah. So at this point, the kernel's gone through the submission queue, it's done the work and it's posted completions, control gets handed back into user space. Um, and then the user space, there's a bunch of helpers as well for user space to kind of go through the completion ring and look at the results of, uh, of each request. And then, yeah, once it's done, it calls this uh, CQ advance function to move, the, uh, to move the head pointer. All right, so next I'll talk about the, uh, the, the design for our proposal. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the first step is to set up the uh, receive in a way such that um, such that the packet payloads end up in user in user space memory, which is its intended destination, and um, we 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 do this by essentially um, filling the hardware RX queues of a NIC with um, DMA addresses that point to user space memory as opposed to kernel memory. And once that's done, the rest kind of works on its own. Um, we don't need to do anything else. And eventually, um, the SK buffs is going to end up in uh, the socket, with the exception that the page frags are going to now refer to our user space pages as opposed to um, kernel kernel pages. Cool. So yeah, the first step we uh, well the user space has to map some memory, and it has to provide it um, to IOU ring and register it. And IOU ring already has. Um, functionality to do this is called registered buffers. So this is pretty much unchanged. We're kind of reusing it as it is. Uh, so yeah, user space maps a bunch of memory and hands it over to IOU ring. Um, IOU ring is then gonna pin those pages and we're gonna end with a vector of these uh, BRO vex. So after that, we want to then fill our um, hardware RX queues with these pages. And we do this um, by building something that's heavily inspired by the, uh, by the existing page pool. So for those who are not familiar, the, the page pool kind of initially started as, um, as a way of filling, well, I think it started as a way for XDP, like a fast path for XDP, like to, to fill, um, to, yeah, to allocate pages but it's kind of evolving into like a generic page allocator for, uh, for NICs. And it, it basically just hands out pages to the NIC uh, and it does a bunch of management of those pages, ref counting and whatnot. So we kind of build like an, an equivalent, except rather than being backed by kernel memory, it's gonna be backed by uh, those user space pages that's just been registered with IOU ring. And in order for the driver to decide which one to use, uh, we add a very thin shim layer um, that kind of looks at the uh, QID and then makes a decision whether to allocate pages for a particular QID um, you know, using the zero copy uh, page pool or by using the standard page pool. 
So once we've set up our hardware RX queues, um, we filled them with user space pages. Um, we obviously don't want, well, we, we, we want very specific flows um, that correspond to the application we are trying to use this with. We only want flows from that to enter our zero copy queue, right? We don't want random flows to enter um, into them. And the way we uh, do this is, well, there's two, yeah, we, we use two hardware features to do this. The first one, um, we use flow steering to kind of steer the, the flows that we want that correspond to our application. We want to steer those into the, um, into the queue. And then we use RSS as well to exclude those queues from um, being, you know, being having other flows hashed into them, so that yeah, we we only get the flows that we want into uh, into our zero copy queues, and um, we also only want the payload to end up in user space, right? We don't want to give user space um, access to the headers, so to do that, we use uh, header splitting, um, such that only the payload ends up uh, in user space. And I think typically, at least it's true for Broadcom, um, for header, like when, when header split and supported, it, we get two different hardware queues, right, per, I guess, QID. There's one for the headers and one for the payloads. And we only fill the payload uh, hardware queue with user space pages. The headers are still filled from the page pool as, uh, as, as before. So yeah, like I mentioned earlier, um, once it's set up, we don't need to really do anything else, right? The, the, the NIC just sees DMA addresses, except they now correspond to um, user space memory. So as it receives packets, um, header splitting happens, the payloads get DMA'd, so that's, they only make one trip over PCIe and, um, and uh, the, the, the main memory bus to its destination. And the headers um, get DMA'd into kernel memory, and then the SKBs get constructed, except the page frags now point to um, user space memory. Then those SKBs just travel through the networking stack as before. Uh, so this is really the one key advantage of our design. Um, you know, it's, it's still going through the networking stack. You still get all of your uh, visibility into the stack, um, all of your um, hooks and BPF and TC and QDisk and whatnot all gets handled by the kernel and you still have all of those things. Um, yeah, except it's, it's, it has a more efficient data path. Oh, and we also mark these SKBs with a uh, special flag and we also set the uh, UBuff as well, such that the networking stack doesn't uh, try to copy it or, or do anything else with it. So like, it just leaves it alone. All right, so next we'll talk about um, how to actually get the data out of these, uh, get, get the SKBs, our zero copy SKBs out of the sockets. And yeah, we do that with IOU ring and we, we do that by adding more rings to IOU ring. Um, we, we add two more rings. We add a um, RXQ ring and we add a uh, refill ring as well. And um, again, these are shared ring buffs between the kernel and the user. And you're going to get a pair of these for every hardware RX queue. And you can kind of think of them as um, like a proxy or making available uh, in user space or giving user space access to the underlying hardware queues. And the RX queue is for user space to kind of receive, um, receive data from, from, from the hardware queue. And the refill ring is a way for the user space to kind of give uh, buffers back. All right, so the, 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 the first stage is we want to submit a request. We want to submit a uh, receive zero copy request. And this part is the, the same as normal. Um, the user space prepares a submission queue entry and um, enters the kernel. And then the kernel is going to service the request by uh, reading data from, uh, reading SKBs from the socket. And um, these in order to distinguish whether these page frags are user space or kernel, we, we tag them with a special cookie. And um, we, if we see the pages in the um, page frags of the SKB, if we see that they have this magic cookie, then we know it's, we don't need to do any copying, right? The data is already there. So this is kind of like a, only like a, like a notification mechanism rather than a data movement mechanism. 
And essentially for each page frag that we see that is already in user space, um, we prepare a um, completion entry in the Rx queue. This is one of the new queues that we added. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a page and an entry in this new uh, Rx queue. And you can see the structure of the, um, of, the, uh, of the completion entry in the Rx queue. There is an offset, a length, uh, and a region. So using that, the user space is going to be able to go kind of find where the data actually, um, the data actually is. And then, yeah, there's another field for some flags. And then there's another field for uh, which socket which socket um, or yeah, which socket the data is actually in. And this is because we, we support multiple sockets uh, for, for each hardware queue. So when the kernel's um, kind of either emptied all of the SKBs from the socket or it's reached some kind of read limit, we return control back into user space and we write a, um, a completion entry in the main completion queue. Um, so that the user space knows it has to go and look inside of the Rx queue to find, uh, to find the data. Right, and now the user, um, upon getting the completion queue entry, the main completion queue entry, um, that will tell the user, okay, my data for my read request is in this specific Rx queue. So the user space then um, goes through this, uh, goes through the Rx queue, it finds the offset, the length, the region that basically tells it, okay, my data for this particular packet is actually here. And then it can go and, and um, read the data, do as it pleases. And once it's done, we need to return that data back to the kernel, back to the driver, such that we can refill our hardware Rx queue. And it does this through the refill ring. Um, pretty simple, it's just the offset length and region. And yeah, user space writes entries, prepares them, writes it into this uh, refill queue. And um, at that point, the, uh, the, the, the zero copy page pool that we added is gonna be um, pulling entries out of, the, uh, out of this refill queue, right? So user space writes entries into the refill queue. Uh, and then when the driver is refilling uh, its pages from the zero copy page pool, it's gonna be then, uh, the zero copy page pool is then gonna be pulling um, buffers out of the refill queue and try to keep it empty. So that's the consumer. Cool. All right, so that's kind of um, an overview of our design. And I'll show some early results that we've been, that, that we got using this. So we, we, uh, we measured the system bandwidth on, um, on, a, on a host with a Broadcom NIC. Uh, that has 62 gigs of RAM, and we use iperf3 as the uh, as the benchmark, and we modify iperf3 to use um, IOU ring and to use this zero copy API that we've added, and we measured the um, system bandwidth using, um, I guess, vendor provided uh, measurement tool. So for AMD, it's uh, uprof. And we can see that um, the, the red line is without zero copy and the blue line is with zero copy. So we see as expected a um, significant drop in the overall system bandwidth. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention, this was at line rate at 25 gigs as well on, uh, on the Broadcom NIC. So yeah, this is identical hardware, except it's with an Intel system with an Intel Xeon. And um, yeah, we measure the memory bandwidth using PCM memory instead. And again, we see a significant drop as well in the overall system bandwidth. So one caveat here is that um, we, we turned off Intel DDIO. Uh, this is a TPU transparent hardware feature that tries to optimize the, um, tries to optimize the RX path by placing uh, packets directly in CPU caches. Uh, we had to turn it off because um, it, it interferes with iperf3. So iperf3 is kind of like the ideal uh, benchmark for DDIO. And um, yeah, so we, we, we turned off DDIO for, uh, for, for these results.
All right, so um, yeah, what's the status of this work if you're, if you're interested? Uh, we've posted V2, uh, a V2 RFC on the mailing list. It's on uh, both NetDev and IOU Ring. So please take a look and comment if you are, yeah, if you want to see the code and play with it. Um, so that's one of the main things we added in the V2, right? So um, we, we initially only supported Broadcom hardware, like a very specific set of Broadcom hardware. Um, but for V2, we added support in VF as well. And um, Pavel did most of that work. And this means that you can kind of play with the, I think the interesting part is with IOU ring and it allows you to kind of play with that part, try out the API um, and see how it feels. So if you're interested, please go and try it. Oh yeah, and I mentioned, yeah, we, we in terms of real hardware, we only really support Broadcom at the moment. And um, and I don't think I don't think you can even use it today because we depend on some out of tree changes from Broadcom. They haven't merged it yet. Um, and then yeah, in V two we also added multi socket support, so you can associate multiple sockets per um, per RXQ. And we also added uh, copy fallback. So you know what happens when the memory region that you register for zero copy RX uh, runs out. Um, before it would just crash, but now we have proper copy fallback. Um, so we will um, copy into kernel memory and uh, make sure that we don't um, we don't crash when that happens. All right. And for future work, um, I mentioned how we we kind of built this clone of um, of, of a page pool. Uh, it's called the yeah the the, the, the zero copy page pool. So uh, Jakob has a uh, RFC for the for the existing page pool is called a memory provider API, and essentially it's an API that allows you to plug in um, arbitrary um, backends to the page pool, and this kind of fits in really well with what we're trying to do, right? So you can imagine rather than having our own custom um, zero copy page pool, rather than having this um, you know arguably ugly shim layer. Right, that's going to require you to go and make changes in each driver that you want to support this in. Um, we can just simply plug in as um, one of the back ends for, um, for what, yeah, one of the memory provider back ends for the page pool. And then the page pool can kind of handle the, the logic of deciding which back end to use for which hardware queue and whatnot. And that kind of really cleans up the, uh, cleans up the design, right? We don't need to go and make changes in, in, in each and every driver. So yeah, that's kind of like the, the, the main thing we want to do for the next iteration of our patch set. Um, we also want to do, uh, we also want to add support for a proper testing device. So the, the hacks that we've done in um, it's, uh, it's it's not for merging, it's, it's, purely, for, uh, it's purely for testing, um, but we do want to add um, some, some proper test device and we want to write proper self-tests. Uh, the other things that I kind of glossed over in this talk is um, the way that we do flow steering, the way that we kind of set up the um, set up the NIC. It's 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 very hacky. It's all kind of out of band using Ethtool, and we would like to kind of integrate that into um, in, into into the work and streamline it. Right, so you can kind of ideally associate the the flow steering rules um, with a socket, you know, which has a um, a four tuple of the source IP port, destination IP and port. So you can kind of like specifically set up and associate full control rules with the socket. I think that would be much neater. And um, yeah, when we do, when we kind of set up the queue for zero copy, um, it's very, it's a very blunt way of doing it right now. So we, we have to bring down the whole device and bring it back up again. And yeah, we think it would be nice if we could dynamically do this on a per queue basis, right? So we don't need to, um, yeah, we don't need to bring down the whole device. And finally, um, we want to support uh, GPU device memory as well. And um, for those of you who are not uh, aware, Google is also doing something like this. They have a TCP dev memory proposal that does just that, right? It will, um, very similar to what we're doing, except the destination is in device memory. And um, we've we've talked with them. We, we, we're going to collaborate with them, and we are going to try and build uh, on top of what they're doing for uh, GPU support. And that's also like an interesting use case for what we're trying to do. So, um, as I understand it, for AI uh, machine learning um, clusters, 
while they may be very optimized in the back end, right, especially with um, NVIDIA GPUs using things like um, NVLink and RDMA, um, we see a lot of potential in the front end network, right? How do you actually get the training data into this uh, ML cluster? And, um, you know, we, 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 we see potential um, there for a, uh, yeah, for, for, for zero copy RX. All right, um, I'm right on time. So there's five minutes. Um, any Q and A's, any questions? Um, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts if you're interested. Um, you know, what, what kind of applications do you see this being useful in? Um, and then I also, I'm also very interested in kind of like the, the, the user space API design as well. Yeah, so you said you're setting up an R, like uh, the RX and re the Q thing per R per hardware RX Q on the NIC yes. for user space. So IO Ring now has my application starts up, I set everything up, mm -hmm. and I have my submission, my completion queue, and now I have 48 other queues, like for like a thing with 24 RX queues or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So like. Now I have to like go and figure out, I assume on the completion queue, you tell me which RX queue it's in, but like, what's the benefit of doing this instead of just having like one of each, right? Like, is there a way that in the kernel that you can just like do the multiplexing yourself to like, okay, this hardware RX queue into like a single RX queue, or is there a reason you need to now that I now need to manage a billion extra mm -hmm. IOU rings? Um, ring buffers, right? Right, right. So we don't we don't set up a um, we don't set up all of the RX queues for zero copy. So that's done on a per queue basis. Right. So there's an API to say, okay, um, I only want queue ID zero to be set up for zero copy. Then we set up a pair of those uh, uh, refill and RX queues for that particular. Okay. So, so if you have four, yeah, if you have twenty four queues, nothing's going to happen. Um, until you kind of say, okay, I want to enable it for you know, Q0 and 10 or something. Okay, so the yeah. application then has to say, like, first of all, the application has to know what RX queue it's going to use. Yeah. And then allocate it, and then it's associated with that hardware queue. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I see a lot of potential for users to fuck this up or just like constantly use RX zero because like they don't yeah. know, right? So like, is there a way that we can make this part like hide those details and be more optimal instead of letting the user? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think in the ideal case, to make it really foolproof, you, you want to do all the registration in one go, like this queue, right? And then these flows and whatnot, right? Is I think on the networking side, we, we don't, have the infrastructure to, to do that today. It's not fully integrated today, if that makes sense, because we can't do this dynamic queue management. Right. Yeah. So what is, okay, so I guess that's the question I'm asking, like, mm -hmm. is, what does dynamic queue management look like? Is that a, is that a realistic goal to have short term or is that like a long term thing or? Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's a longer term thing that we don't want to explicitly depend on. Like, we don't want it to be a blocker for this patch set. Oh, so uh, oh. I was also arguing that we should allocate the hardware queue dynamically, like not the user space specifying the index, but it just the kernel allocate some random queue for you. Could work, should, should be relatively simple. So, so uh, I have a microphone. So the only thing you basically need is page put to allocate pages for you, which will also map in user space, the data portion. I'm sorry, could you please no, no. repeat? So, so yeah. what the, the change, so the having an extra allocator on page pool makes sense, right? Yes. The, the change to the existing allocators we have is gonna be, you allocate those buffers or pages or fragments or whatever we're doing, yeah. and you need to map them to user space as well for IOU ring to do the zero copy. It's the other way around. Yeah, the IU yeah. ring needs to, okay. Yeah. Uh, have you, so w another thing that we do in Pagepool is that we manage to recycle those buffers. And yes. I don't know if your network interface supports that, but th that would be an interesting number to look at. Uh, what happens if you also recycle those zero copy buffers? And as far as the configuration is concerned, Jakub has a, uh, a Netlink patch set that we use to get stats, right? We can mm -hmm. tweak that. 
Yeah. And we can use, you can set up the, the NIC at runtime, basically. You can set up which use you need for zero copy, which use mm -hmm. you need. You can even tweak the recycling uh, capabilities because the recycling is just one function we call on the receive path. We can make that configurable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we can look into that, yeah. So we can basically orchestrate the whole thing at runtime. Okay, you, you mm -hmm. might have to bring down the interface. Uh, <laughs> I don't know yeah, how much. I think I think that's that a guy. big pre yeah, that's, like that's, precursor, that's, pre like that kind of precludes uh, runtime. Uh, so in the context of uh, stackable workload containers, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you think this page allocation can be accounted per container or do you think we will be needing to, you know, keep a separate pool of memory and then add more holdback to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a that's, really that's good question. Um, we don't we don't support containers. We don't support VMs today. We're not looking into that for the initial version. Um, we're kind of assuming we're assuming bare metal, right? You're you're just running your service. You're running your workload on on, on a bare host, and you have access to the physical NIC. Um, and then, yeah, I think once this version kind of gets into gets into a state where it can be merged, we'll then look into yeah adding support for 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 containers and and VMs and whatnot. Yeah. And at the very, like, the page allocations part of this is simple. Like, that just works currently. So, like, you know, your space just does their thing and sends it up, and that's all accounted for in the normal C group stuff. So, like, mm -hmm. that, for me, is the least of my worries. Yeah. The more interesting part is, like, well, yeah, if you're using containers, you're using, um, like, VETH or, or the new net kit that um, people mentioned in, in, in this conference, um, how we set up the queues and whatnot. Last quick question, because we're running out of time. I'll go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering what the what it looks like on the IOMMU side. So, as you map these pages in user space and for the receive queue and unmap them with a, um, are you keeping static? Uh, like, from, is that are, are you are you redoing uh, IOMMU, IOMMU config or is this just still the Nick? sees that map and it's just getting added and removed from user space how what does that end up looking like on the user space side you mean on the from the device side view of memory and also also from user space yeah and how those are synchronized or not so are you are you asking how the pages are synchronized between user space and the device yeah i, I can catch you after if that's okay easier. yeah okay Right. All thank right. you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you.